Away for another Vaughan boundary. <laughs> well, he's a great fieldsman, Philip Tuffner. He often falls over and he's brought it into his batting as well. Hello everyone and welcome to the Vaughan and Tuffers Cricket Club podcast brought to you by The Telegraph. Mike, Phil and me, Ben Wright, with you once again. And once again we are discussing a sensational win for England's cricket team after they came back from a 190 run deficit to beat India in Hyderabad. They were helped on their way by a majestic 196 from Ollie Pope, his first ever second inning century, before the debutant spinner Tom Hartley ripped through the home side with figures of 7 for 62. There was also, of course, some inspired fielding and captaincy from Ben Stokes. We'll be discussing what he got right and conversely what the India skipper, Rohit Sharma, got wrong. I'm also absolutely delighted to say that our guest today is none other than David Bumble Lloyd. We'll get his take on the series and, as an ex-England coach, his view on Brendan McCullum. Plus, we'll also be talking about sensational win for the West Indies in Australia and looking ahead to England's second test next week. Right, so morning, Phil. Evening, Mike, where you are. Um, lots to talk about. So before this Saturday, we'd have said that India almost never loses at home. County cricket doesn't produce enough decent spinners. And cricket in uh, the West Indies is dead and buried. So it's been quite a weekend for Test cricket. We've got to start with England's win in Hyderabad. After the match, Ben Stokes said it was the best win of his time in charge as captain. But, Mike, I know from your column that you think it was even better than that, right? Yeah, I do. I mean... Uh... I, honestly, I've, I've been trying to rack my brains about England's great wins. And you kind of go back to 81, beefy at Headingley. Um, we had a great win in Karachi, early 2000s, obviously. Headingley, 2019. But to win in India, when you've got a 190-run deficit on the pitch that was, you know, let's be honest, it was spinning square from pretty much, well, ball one. Um, and to think that England... Had a batter going at number three that in the first innings looked like he he was probably better off bet, batting left-handed. Um, I, I I was staggered, staggered to see them get over the line. I I, I just thought it was an incredibly skilled performance. Um, the way that Ollie Pope played him, mean, I know he's had a huge amount of uh, credit over the last few days, and many a talk. Even Rohit Sharma said it's you know one of the great innings of a overseas player in Indian conditions. It. It was incredible. I remember Kevin Peterson producing innings in Mumbai, and that was very, very special. And, uh, you know, to think that uh, Ollie Pope's done it. And Kevin was a brilliant player of spin, and I think Ollie really worked hard on his game against spin. And as I said in the first innings, it didn't look like his uh, hard work that had paid off, really. Um, but then to see him play those reverse sweeps and the switch hits and, you know, just manoeuvring the ball in the gaps, the field was spreading, just not the ones and the twos. And to keep his composure with the tail end, uh, remarkable victory and remarkable innings. Yeah, Phil, and uh, obviously we talk about sort of adversity. I mean, if you think about the bowlers, uh, Leach obviously was carrying an injury. Uh, Rehan's only played one uh, test. Hartley was on debut. We had lots of overs being bowled by one Joe Root. Uh, absolutely, and Joe looked, Joe looked the best England spinner in the first innings by a mile. Um the guys didn't particularly settle. Tom Hartley didn't settle. Uh, Ran Ahmed. <laughs> you know, they, they, in England, you've got to, uh, sorry, in India, you've got to have some form of control. And thankfully, Joe, in that first innings, gave Ben Stokes some form of control because it was pinging around everywhere. I think England got a little bit lucky in that first innings. Um, a couple of the guys you know, caught in the deep. And I think India will be ruined those decisions. You know, a couple caught deep square leg and what have you. Um, otherwise, they could have gone on and got some more. But it just shows um, the resilience of that outfit, you know, and uh, and especially Tom Hartley, because he would have been going to bed and, you know, with all the best will in the world, he, he bowled poorly in that first innings, managed to get himself a couple of wickets, but then they come down and come back and do what he did in that second innings. Um, it, it, it's a massive feather in his cap. Seven for uh, in India, and um, you know, and just bowled wonderfully. Well, and bowled his side to victory. So uh, an, an amazing performance by Tom Hartley as well. We said we said it last week about India. If they, if they yeah. produce a pitch that brings England into the equation, England can win, and that's exactly what's happened. You know, the pitch. You know, I don't think Tom Hartley's a, a massive 
spinner of the ball. I don't think he gives it a huge rag, but the pitch did the rest, and he was accurate in the second inch coming from that tall height. I think his runs, you know, that, that little innings that he played yeah. and that partnership that he got with Oli Pope, I reckon that would have given him a huge boost going into that second innings with the ball in his hand. And to think that England, I've I, I watched pretty much all of it uh, working in Australia. At the back of the commentary box, we had the, the iPad on watching England. Uh, obviously, I was involved in a great test match here, but we were kind of glued to the TV because everyone was hovered around just watching. In particular, when England batted, um, you can't take your eyes off them. And the crowd at the Hyderabad Stadium was huge, particularly at day three. What was the reaction in Australia to what was going on in Hyderabad? Well, our game finished on the Sunday afternoon and, and, and we all just went straight to a pub to to watch the England Test match. We had like the Super Sunday. Um, Shamar Joseph bowled in the West Indies to victory. We then went to the pub and uh, I never thought I would be able to say that. I probably was in a pub with 25 Australians. It was me and Isha Guhar and uh, her husband, Rich, and I reckon the whole of the pub was supporting England. Even the Australians were cheering it Tom Hartley on. Yeah, it just, it, it was, it was, well, but I just think because of the way that England played, I think because India are, are this powerhouse, uh, you know, the pitch is always, and rightfully so, they're allowed to have uh, conditions in their, their, their kind of home favour. Um, there's something about, I think people like to see the underdog, and when you talk about you mentioned that attack. The England attack had no experience. It had no kind of know-how of how to bowl in those conditions. Yet they got the job done. It was incredible to see a pub full of Australians cheering Tommy Hartley. I think he looks like Bobby Charlton, though, Phil. Yeah, he's got that little bit of a comb over, really. <laughs> Listen, Mike, just, just, I'm, I'm going to say this now, right? Okay. Now, you've watched the way that India, and you were talking about spinning pitches earlier. I think England and the way they play with the sweeps and the reverse sweeps, Indian Indians batting line up don't really sweep, do they? So on spinning pitches, am I going to say that the England batting lineup is more equipped to score runs than the Indian batting lineup on on spinning pitches? Can I say that because I saw Ro I saw Rohit um, Sharma trying to reverse sweep in the second dig. I mean that's yeah. flattery, isn't it? Yeah, no, I think I think you're right. But look, the, the series is young. There's four games to go, so we'll have to see how it pans out. But, you know, that reverse sweep in particular, it, it's caused chaos. And I love Joe Root's comment. I think it was after day three. He, 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 he was obviously asked about playing the sweep and the reverse sweep. And he said, we just stare at the ball and hit it. We don't even think about missing it. And that's the mindset that Baz McCullum and, and Ben Stokes has put into these players. That if you go out playing, it's a risky shot. Um, you know, you know, it is a, it's a hard shot to execute. But if you have the mindset and you practice it that hard and your mindset is to hit the ball, I honestly think you've got a, a, an incredible... And also, if you get out playing it, you're not going to get told mm. off. That's the yeah. key. If you get out playing the message from this dressing room that you find, that's the way that we want you to play. We want you to go and cause a bit of chaos. Uh, I, I thought Rohit Sharma's captaincy, Phil, was, was average. Yeah. You know, I, I thought he let the game drift. I was staggered that the left armers, Axel Patel and Jadeja, didn't try it over the wicket to Ollie yeah. Pope. Yeah. You know, the, the late great Shane Warne, you know, on a pitch that was ragged, if someone got in a right, and I guess what he used to do, come round the wicket, fire it yeah. outside yeah. leg stump and say, go on, try and sweep me then from outside leg stump. Yeah. To think that they didn't try that was was staggering. They'll come up with a couple of new tricks for the second test match, I'm sure, because they have to, because if they don't react and don't come up with something to kind of counteract this reverse sweep, as you say, Phil, I, I think it could go a long way in that. For, I don't want to say it yet. It could go a long way for England having a bit more success yeah. on this tour. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a very, very hard shot if it's played well to captain against because oh. you, you, you basically, the whole quarter of the ground, you need three fielders. Yeah. yeah. And if you've got three fielders in one quarter of the ground, the rest of the ground is so much of a, a space. So you get one, of, thank you, up to there, or there's a boundary on that side. Very, very difficult to play against. And, and Phil, as a spinner, can you yeah. explain to us why it is so difficult bowling to batsmen who yeah. are using the, the sweep and the reverse sweep? Absolutely. Well, it becomes like a, a, a release shot. As a spin bowler, you want to bowl a set of six, get him under pressure, get him pinned down. 
for a start off, you've got to take one of your fielders and put him at third man almost, you know, and just cruising around out there. And another thing that England did, they weren't just getting singles from it. They were scoring fours from it. You know, as you say, Mike was saying, you're going to have to have a couple out there because it's just not that little reverse sweep, trickles down to him, picks it up, throws it in one run, which is still handy because it releases the pressure and you can rotate strike and everything. But also... It, it, it's one of your, it, it's a, it's usually a sort of a length delivery. You run up, you bowl a decent ball or middle and off stump or something if you're a left arm spinner and the bloke hits your so-called a wicket taking delivery, which is length yeah. before or, or a single. So then that gets in your mind and you start going, well, hold on a minute. My stock delivery <laughs> is going for either a one or a four. You know, and so you then start going, well, I'm going to have to try and bowl it a little bit fuller to get it under his bat and hit him on the pad. And then all of a sudden, oh, well, there's the half volley that you can knock down to um, to, to, to deep mid on and rotate strike. So you think to yourself, all oh, right, well, I'm going to bowl it a little bit shorter, hope to get one to bounce and get a top edge. And then if he sees that length early, he rocks back, cuts it or knocks it on the leg side for the rotation of strike. You can't apply any pressure and it very very quickly runs away from you and you're feeling that you're bowling six decent sort of stock deliveries on middle middle and off stump length balls that can perhaps you know get an edge or get caught somewhere and all of a sudden you're going at four or five and over and you're going well hold on a minute what am I going to do here I'm not applying any pressure so that's and it gets in your mind it really does I mean it drives you crazy yeah. because you feel that you're bowling well and you bowled five overs, number 35. <laughs> and, he, and he clearly got to the India bowlers, didn't he? Because you could see with Ashwin and Jadeja, they looked they looked like it, they were they were upset. And, and, and Ashwin, you know, is is a is a very he's he, he's a student of the game. Yeah. Ashwin, you know, he thinks about everything, and he's like all oh, release points, and is he bowling like this, and he's got this, and he's got the Karen ball, and he, you know, he completely sort of like thinks really in depth about how to go about bowling spin bowling, and you could see that it got under his skin, and he didn't really have an answer. And then all of a sudden, that just knocks you off your rhythm, knocks you off how you're going about things, and it unsettles you, and it unsettled Ashwin. In India, who's one of the best bowlers in the world, and let as you say, I don't want to say too early. He didn't have an answer for it. Yeah, I mean, Mike, do we? Is this a sort of classic example of a team versus a set of individuals? Because we discussed last week that on paper, India easily the better side. Yeah, I mean, you, you could argue that that's been the case with with India for a while. I mean, they've had two amazing wins here in Australia. You know, the only team that's come to Australia. And, and beaten uh, this Australian juggernaut. But outside of that, you know, they, they are a, a, a team that, like, I understand it in India. Individuals get so much attention. Uh, they get a huge amount of commercial value from, you know, their own personal brand. So I guess we have to understand that. But, you know, you're absolutely right. It, it was an England side that are just so together and they're so committed to this this way of playing. And it's hard. And, and, and I'll go back the two years that the bad ballers have been playing. They've got the first of the first test of most series. They've got the opposition. Even Australia edged Baston. They, <laughs> they had, they had them. Moral you, victory. You go back to New Zealand. It takes a while to get used to playing. If you don't do your research and you don't do your, your kind of analyst work of the way this England playing, you just think you can turn up and just play. And I guess after two and a half days, you know, India would have been delighted. Oh. Now they'd have been delighted because they were controlling the game. This approach, it doesn't take long for England to get back into the game. You know, you, you look at the 190 deficit, what was it, 47 overs? Yeah. And and the back the back on parity, you think, you go back, you know, just a few years, England would have probably taken 60, 70 overs to get to that 190, and, and, and I would guess get bowled out. My worry, if I was India, is if you go back to the last series, England went one up on a flat one. It was really flat. Joe got a double century, bit of reverse swing. Uh, spin came into the play later on in the in, in the piece. This pitch was like the pitches that they prepared after that. Now this isn't a pitch that England should win on. When it's ragging with that attack, that England England should not win that Test match. And now they've won it. I can all I mean Jadeja's out, Kale Rahul's out. Yeah. Two huge experienced cricketers for the next Test match. Um, I'm I'm intrigued to see how India cope with this. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really intrigued to see what they do to counter attack this approach, how they play what pitch they prepare. Because if they prepare another Bunsen from ball one, Hartley, if Jack Leach is fit, he doesn't look like he'll be fit to me, Joe Root, 
uh, Ren. I'll just mention one thing on, on what I thought. I thought Ben's innings in the first innings were special. Yeah, yeah. The 70 Ben Stokes got. I mean, the Oli Pope 196 is, is what we all should be talking about. But Ben Stokes, is 70, just got England just a little number. It wasn't a big number. But it could easily have been a 160 all out. Yeah. yeah. He's, and I thought his captaincy, it was a masterclass. A masterclass. Firstly, in the first things with Tom, I was crying at the stream. Take him off, take him <laughs> off. Yeah, he kept him on because he knows psychology. Yeah. And in the second, it's just a little thing that he did towards the back end of the game where he, you know, I don't think he was ever getting towards an arsenic, but he was getting c- kind of close. He put Ray on Armid on. Yeah, yeah. He put him on for a reason. And the reason was he wanted that young kid to get the last wicket. Yeah. It was a psychological move that he was saying to the youngster, I'm backing you. And I want you to be the person that bowls us to victory. He is not just a captain of cricket. He is a psychologist. He's a genius at knowing how to deal with people. And also on that, Mike, as well, we were talking about Tom Hartley. He got him his two wickets. You know, he got two wickets, didn't he? And he burned burned three... In the uh, first innings. Yeah, he burned three referrals to get in the first 11 overs, almost to get him that wicket. You know what I mean? It, 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 It was a bit of a masterclass. But then also... I think he learned from that in the second innings, Mike, as well. You know, you you can't just start off, you know, with three or four men round the bat. I know it's attacking, what have you, but in that second innings, he just gave him a bit of breathing space, didn't he? He gave him a little bit of... I'm not even saying it's a defensive field, having a deep square leg to the left, a deep mid-wicket to the left-hander, but he just didn't... He gave him that little bit of breathing space, the spin bowlers. As you say, I thought he capped him beautifully in the second innings. And the first innings, even though perhaps it was looking a little bit too hard for the spinners just to get into a rhythm in that second innings... He, he gave them some breathing space and it worked perfectly. Mike, you said you're intrigued to see what India will do to, to counter this. Um, what what do you suspect they'll do? As you say, Raul and Jadeja are out. Jadeja especially is a massive loss. I mean, he was looking brilliantly brilliant in the first half of the of the game. He's, that's, he's probably one of the best all-rounders in the world at the moment, isn't he? Well, I think he, I think he, is, I think he is the best all-rounder in the world. I think he's absolutely fantastic. Um Oh, I think they'll bring in Washington Sundar. I think he'll come in. Uh, the off spin and left hand batter, a good player again, an all round cricket of uh, huge skill in those conditions. Uh, it, it's more the mindset for India. Yeah, you know, it is. And in the field, are they going to are they going to spread the field again? Because as Phil was mentioned about bowling to these these players that reverse sweep and, and switch it and then sweep conventionally, your best balls are going for runs, and then you go challenging and chasing, and then you fire it, and then they dance down and whack you over the top. Yeah. I honestly, the more I, more I see the basketball way of playing, the more you have to kind of squeeze them. You have to gamble. You have to almost say, keep your feel. As soon as you spread, I think they're learning very quick this thing. They did it in the Ashes that once the field's really spread, they're getting very good at just knocking it, knocking it into the gaps. And I would be saying to them, right, I want you to, those revert, you, you look at uh, Oli Pope, who was dropped on 110 at Axel Patel, backward point. That, that position for me is a very aggressive attacking fielding position against this England side. And even having the backward point up, yeah, just yeah. for a few they go on, keep trying it. Because if you allow this field to spread against England, I honestly think they're getting, they're playing quite smart. Yeah. yeah. It's, and these aggressive shots, we, we kind of watch it, oh, that's, that's massively risky yeah. playing the reverse. Not for these players. They know exactly how to play it, the technical side of the way that they're playing and the mindset of how you play it is absolutely spot on. So India will have to come up with something. It might be that they have to gamble and bring the field up. And obviously winning the toss and batting first could be quite a nice <laughs> nice option as well. But uh, they're not easy to play against the basketball. They're very, very difficult. Yeah. And also on that, it's just a fantastic way to start the series. You, I mean, India are now under pressure and they're under pressure and that's not just the players or the or the or the the new players that are coming in. It, it, it's the pressure of the whole, you know, India. You know, we know what a pressure cooker that is. You know, and, and you know, in the spotlight and what have you. Now that just all of a sudden heaps even more pressure on this India side to try and um, you know come up with something. And that without Jadeja, no Kohli, no KR. Well, I heard Harsha on the radio. He he was talking. I mean, I love Harsha, but he was on about the switch here. Is it is it illegal? Should it be banned? <laughs> just because you're getting a few runs, you can't ban it. But you're right. This victory has just put them now 
in a bit of a quandary. They don't, they, they, they're sort of like, hold on a minute, as you, as you were saying, Mike, do we play him on spinners? Do we play him on... They might, have to, they might have to leave a bit of grass on one of them if that's possible over there. I'm not sure because where they have got the beating of us, Shiraz, Bumrah and Sammy when he comes back. So it, it, it's, it's made them a little bit confused in their thinking as well. And, and that's what happens when you win a first test match, it throws the opposition into like, oh my God, what are we going to do now? It gives me huge pleasure to welcome to the podcast player, umpire, coach and commentator extraordinaire, David Lloyd. Bumble, thank you so much for joining us. First up, how much did you enjoy England's win in Hyderabad? Well, absolutely thrilled. Uh, four o'clock in the morning is a bit of a challenge. And after two <laughs> days, you think, well, this will be over very, very quickly. But you never write these guys off. They've got an enormous belief. And failure is something that they just don't think about. I thought yeah. it was a stunning win. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as a former England coach, um, what have you made of the the impact of Brendan McCullum? Um, what, what's, what's he getting right? Well, they're getting everything right. And you know, the, the, the new book that, that's out with Nick Holt and yeah. Lawrence Brew, they've called it Baz Ball, which Baz doesn't like at all. But when you read it, his first introduction to the team, he said, are you ready for a ride? Well, well, that is fantastic. When you're dealing with young people, of course they're ready for a ride. They're yeah. representing the country. Don't be stayed. Don't be what if. Let's go and do it. And I think they've captured the imagination of all cricket lovers. And I, th I think that we've really got under the skin of the Australians where, because they're still on about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was actually reading some, I can't remember who wrote the article, but reading an article um, after the win over the weekend and somebody was suggesting maybe it should be called Baz Bloke instead of Baz Ball because it's sort of more about man management than tactics. But it's both really, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is. I mean, man management is is paramount, I think, when you're dealing with elite sportsmen. I, it, it, I mean, the, the word coach is a misnomer because, you know, you've got, say, Kevin Peterson or somebody like that, Michael Vaughan, he ain't going to go up to him and say, I think you're holding it wrong. I think you're not, <laughs> you're not holding the bat proper. You know, you, you're sort of preparing the ground and giving them information, what you're doing, I think, and what I try to do is give players information of who they're going to be playing against, sort out the preparation prior to the game, and then it's over to them. It's over to the captain tactically, and it's over the players to, to respond and to play. So that they, I hope, and I'm absolutely certain, that they're having a ball. Bumble Tuffers here, mate. Um, it, 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 I, I still can't quite put my finger on it, really. I mean, we've been involved in dressing rooms and they keep saying yeah. about the messaging and everyone's got belief. I mean, we've been involved in that as yeah. well. But, I mean, 190 behind, I think they were still 30 behind, you know, when uh, they were five down. Yeah. The, 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 is, is there something that we're not missing as sort of like media people on the outside that they're doing? Or is it just as simple as... Come on, lads, go and give it a go. Well, you look at the results they've had since McCullum came in, and whatever they're doing is absolutely yeah. working. Now, if you watch the if you watch the interviews after the game, and we, you know I'm I'm in the UK and I'm watching it, I thought they're under the pump here. Yeah, this could end very quickly. They, they interviewed Ben Duckett, who said we've had a fabulous day. And they were one down for 120, <laughs> chasing 240. He says, oh, we've, we've had a fabulous day. It's been terrific. And then they interview Joe Root. And Joe Root says, right, from now on, we've got to work out how we win the game. So there's no question of, yeah. right, we're in an absolute jam. How can we survive? Can we draw this? Can we come out of it with a positive which yeah. is always something in it. Oh, well, the positives, well, there are no positives when you lose, mate. There are no. And so they were all talking about how do we win the game? And I think that comes back to McCullum. Mm. There's a fair amount of Rob Key in it and yeah. a big dollop of Ben Stokes. Right, OK, we're under the pump. Right, how do we win it? And that, they went that, and did it. That Rob Key uh, that, that you mentioned, that, that that's key, isn't it? And I suppose as somebody who's been in McCullum's position, how how important is it that you get the kind of air cover from the guy above you to allow you to do what you want? I think that's a, a massive insight, Ben. 
that's exactly what you want. You don't want to be looking over your shoulder. Um, if things have not gone right, I mean, I had it that many times when, <laughs> and you've got to go into a meeting and dealing with suits and what happened here and what happened there. You know, they were better than us. They played better cricket than us. You know, we, we were just coming up short. And so when everybody's singing from the same hinge sheet, as they say, that Rob Key is a, I mean, he's a massive mate. I knew exactly what they were getting with Rob Key, and it was Strauss that put him in that position. And so there's an axis that they're all looking the same way. They're all wanting the same thing. And what are they doing in Test Match Cricket? They're flipping it on its head. And they're saying, T20's here to stay. We're going to play Test Match Cricket in a similar sort of way. Yeah. Uh, coach, should have we played more golf? <laughs> I mean, I'd have loved to have done it. I, I mean, that, I were only there for about three years or so, and I, I'm a huge believer in time away. But your mate, a Sane, a Sane and Thorpe, and one or two others, John Crawley, they always wanted to be in the nets. Oh, can't we? What are we doing? Having a, we don't want a day off. Well, it, you know, if they're batting, some poor sod's got a ball at them. And they don't want to be. You've got to look after your bowlers. You've got to protect your bowlers. Get out on a... The best thing that we did, Cap, we're going on that John Paul Getty's yacht. Fantastic. We, we got a oh, day on yeah. his yacht. It, I mean, it, it was called the Talitha G, and it was better than the Royal Yacht. It was better than that. Okay, explain this. Why, why, were, you, why were you on John Paul Getty's uh, yacht? How did that come about? He, he was he was a cricket fanatic, and he, were, he was in the West Indies, anchored up. He came to the game, and he said to Bob Bennett, our manager, "Would you like to bring the boys on the boat? Of course we would." <laughs> and I can't. I think everybody went, but I won't be surprised if a same turned up late, and he were in the nets. I've got a little story about that. We've all gone on there, and as you say, and it was like something out of Death on the Nile. Yeah. It was an amazing, like old school, wasn't it? All wood and yeah. beautiful. That yeah. three funnels on it yeah. and everything. And we've all gone on there, and there's this wonderful bar, and they all had staff and everything. And I've gone up to the bloke, and I and he was pouring the champagne, and I've gone, um, I've gone. I hope you've got a little bit more of that, mate, because the boys are a bit thirsty. <laughs> And he said, would you like to come with me? And he took me off. We went in the lift down about sort of three stories and he opened this sort of like Aladdin's cave and there was about a thousand bottles of Dom Perignon. And he's looked at me and he said, I don't even think you could get through that, Mr. Tufnell. <laughs> really, really, Dom Perignon. Did you put a dent in it at least? I, I know that I know them lads had an absolute ball. I've still got pictures. And, and Mark Elam, bless him, who was on the tour, he got one of them. What do they call them? You'd, you'd sit on it like a motorbike on on the on the sea. So he, he didn't know how to do it at all. And he runs straight into these rocks and it sunk. It just disappeared. And so we to get him back on the boat and and they just said, oh, we'll get another. It's all right, we'll get another one. They just oh, sunk and rub it into some stones, some rocks. Yeah. So, I mean, Phil, if it, you were part of this regime, I assume you would have liked a couple of days off. Didn't you put your foot down? Well, no, no absolutely. But, I mean, I'll I, I tell you what I think must be going on um, uh, uh, in that sort of dressing room. It must be, A, a very resilient dressing room. But then also, I mean, let's just look at that. I'm just thinking of being a left-arm spinner. You know, Tom Hartley in that first innings, I mean, bless him, he, he bowled poorly. I know he was throwing the new ball, which I think... I mean, Ben Stokes has got so many things right, but I think he might have got that wrong. But who knows? It might have been the sort of making of him in the second innings. I'm not sure. But, you yeah. know, I can remember, you know, if I'd have had that sort of day, you know, you sort of go on, you go back into the dressing room and you sort of go, oh, crikey, O'Reilly, things haven't gone so well. And a couple of the boys might have come up to you and sort of gone... Oh, you know, unlucky and everything. But they must be, they must be sort of like getting round people like that who haven't had a great day. You know what I mean? And building them up somehow. And I think that must come down to Ben Stokes, the captain, in that belief. Yeah. You know, just to, you know, because then to come back after that sort of a bit of a mauling, and you can see he was bowling long ops and half volleys and everything. I know it was his debut and everything, so he was being nervous and what have you. But then to come back and perform. In that second innings and get seven foot and bowl out the Indians in their own backyard, 
is some kind of yeah. kind of turnaround. So you know what I mean. There must be that sort of like, and I, and I can only put that down to Ben Stokes and Brendan McCullum, sort of like getting the getting your head straight again to go again. Amazing, amazing performance. Well, totally. I mean, I think it's you, you, obviously it's Stokes, but it's this sort of clarity of purpose, right? Yeah. I mean, Bumble, you were saying that he, they weren't thinking about a draw. Well, they've just taken the draw out of the equation. They're only ever going for the win, and if they lose in going for the win, they're happy with that. And and the same with Hartley, right? They he, Ben Stokes after the match, he said, you know, I backed him a hundred percent. If I'm backing him a hundred percent, I've got to let him bowl. So you you don't pull him off just because he's being tonked into the stands in the first innings. And that shows the the young bowler that the the captain has got his back, and lo and behold, he does. He, that gives him the confidence to perform in the second innings. Yeah, I mean, he is good stock, Tom Hartley. His his sort of background is is pretty <laughs> steady. Um, he, he plays at Lanks, and he's probably at Lancashire. You might you might argue he's the second left arm spinner. Jack Morley would play more red ball cricket than he would, and and Tom Hartley would maybe seen as a, a white ball player. But again, talking to to Rob Key throughout last summer, and chewing the fat, you know, you you, you taught the game. You, what do you need? What do we need in India? And I said, you, you know, you've got to be looking for tall bowlers who hit the pitch hard, because you're going to come up against spinning pitches from ball one. I said, and flight bowlers are not necessarily the way to go. If you if you look at Shane Ward, the greatest spin bowler perhaps that we've ever seen. His optimum pace, 49, 50 miles an hour. If you look at Jadeja and Ashwin, 60 miles an hour. And the big, tall guys who drive it into the pitch. And that's what Tom Hartley would be doing. And Bashir, once he gets out there, Bashir would probably do the same. And I'm going to give you another one who I think will come through with a wet sail. I think this lad will play for England sooner rather than later and that's the carries down at Middlesex because he's tall, balls a good pace, bats pretty well and he's perfect for McCullum and Stokes. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 totally agree. So there is a little bit more of a thought behind it. I mean, they've obviously, I mean, it, it, it is almost like a clone of that Axar Patel, that Tom Hartley, isn't it? He bowls it with that sort of slightly round arm, yes. drives it into the pitch, looks to hit pads, looks to bowl middle stump, middle and leg, and if there's some turn, yeah. hit the top of off. So they've obviously sort of like horses for courses sort of gone for Tom Hartley, and they've absolutely yeah. nailed it. Yeah. And you're right, that Bashir bumble is an absolute unit. He's he's about six foot five in here or something. He's six foot four, and so I don't yeah. think that they. I don't think that they. That this regime particularly look at stats. You know, they look at the person and their attributes to what they can bring. You know what I mean? I think he's played six six first class games at Bashir, but they've seen something in him and said, "Listen, if we back him." We don't need it. We don't need pages full of stats of how we bowled at bloody, you know, yeah, Essex yeah. or Glamorgan or something like that. It's a completely different ball game. They're getting it so right. And also, I've looked at some of the test matches. You know, Stokes and um, Stokes and McCullum have played in this Basball era. There's some sort of test matches. I don't know. I don't know how they can keep it going. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's almost like they've got to be behind the eight ball. To almost then come out and play. I mean, it's just incredible some of the games that they've, they've, they've produced under this regime. I mean, the, the, the fitness levels of, of, of it, to be in India and the fitness levels are off the scale. Yeah. And, and talking fitness levels, Ben, I've got I've got to tell you about the catting. Uh, we were in uh, <laughs> Jamaica, and and it was a fitness day. You had a you have a fitness trainer. He's thrown to him fitness. <laughs> And the, this fitness trainer, a lad called Dean Ridley, says, right, we, we're going to kick off along this promenade here. He said, it, it, we're going to have a three-mile run. He said, it's a mile and a half out and a mile and a half back. So I look at the cat and he, he's not happy with this. So I said, <laughs> you and me, cat, we'll run at the back. We'll go at the back, but we're not stopping. I said, we'll go at the back and we'll jog along at our pace. To which he said, well, just, ah, that's great. Hang on, I'll go and get me fags. <laughs> so he then puts his fags in his pocket. And we go a mile and a half out and come back a mile and a half. And I thought, he's going to peg out here. He's on his knees. He's coughing and wheezing and spluttering. And I said, how are you feeling now, cats? He said, well, boss, he said, if they ever find anybody that can hit it three miles, I'll be able to fetch it back. <laughs> <laughs> I think they did as well. 
How many cigarettes do you smoke in a three mile run, Phil? Well, there you go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. But it was uh, <laughs> my coach, David Lord, he was the first one, actually, who tried to sort of see that in a squad, you know, that we were different people. Different people need different things. Mm. You know, some need that, some need this, some need a three mile run, some just need a nice little net and then to go and play golf. And uh, that's obviously now what they're doing. They must be very shrewd. And, um, you know, very good sort of like analysts on what make individuals tick, you know. Yeah, I mean, Bumble, how did, how did you see the job? Because you you were obviously famous for sort of setting up quite a sort of, sort of support system for the players and also being open to new ideas. Yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it's a different era. So I saw my job as, as adjutant to the captain. It's the captain's team. And whether it was Alex Stewart or, or Michael Atherton, it's their team. So I saw my job as preparing and sort of sort out the practice and the facilities and so on, give strengths and weaknesses of the opposition you're going to come up against, and then the lads would get on to it. But, you know, I, from a time at lengths, I didn't want to treat 20 people the same. You can't say, this is what we're going to do. And I always, I, I remember people saying with Phil Tufnell, that, oh, be careful with him, he's bad news, and so on. He just said to him, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? And if he says, I'll ball for 40 minutes, that's fine, thanks a lot, I'll see you in a bit then. Okay. And so you, you'd see other people would say, I want, a, I want a bat, and then I want to come back and have another bat. All right, well, we'll sort that out as well. Um, Dean Headley, I want to work on me no balls. I want, well, you really do want to work on them because you're bowling a lot of them. <laughs> and so he would work with Bob Cotton. Your wicket keepers would work with Alan Knott. So, you know, you're just sorting things out. You can't say all 20 of us are going to do this cause, no. because they're going to kick off. They're, they're yeah. not going to do it. And, and I think also Stokes has got to have a huge pat on the back. I see, I was sitting there thinking that he might have got that slightly wrong in the, England's first innings. I think his field placings were slightly wrong. But he learned from that very, very, very quickly in that second innings. You know, you can't have three or four men round the back. You know, you've, you've got to have a few sort of scouts. And there is obviously Baz Ball, we know, with the bat, but there is Baz Ball with the ball as well. And sometimes if you stick one out at deep mid wicket, it is almost like a. De- it's not necessarily a defensive position in India. It's almost like an attacking position because that's their, that's mm. almost their release shot. And it's funny that, you know, I think that he learned that towards the, the end of that first innings as well, because a lot of their players on 80 got out in the deep, didn't they? A lot were caught at sort of, you know, the guys yeah. who were patrolling. So I think that he learned that very quickly with his spinners in that second innings when he just let them get into the game a little bit. You have your slip, you have one in front, short leg for pad bat or bat pad or what have you, and then just give them that little bit of time. So I think he's got to take great credit. He, he don't get many things wrong. You know Ben Stokes as a captain, and I think you know he, he deserves great credit, and they, and they're obviously, you know, you know, revering him so much. These guys, they really are playing from. You're talking about McCullum, and when Bumble was sort of doing the coach, I think that sort of McCullum is now sort of, you know, Ben. He's Ben Stokes's team, you know, and they are right behind him, and they sort of love him. You can see the love for him, you know. We're obviously talking about. England in in Hyderabad, but uh, it was a, it was a good weekend for Test cricket in general with the Windies beating Australia in Brisbane. A um, lot of chat about Test cricket at the moment. Bumble, how optimistic or pessimistic are you for the for the future of the format? Well, you know, you're looking at Test cricket in the UK, and they're, they're sold out. Whoever we play, we sell out, particularly the first three days. Um, I. My own personal view is the big three that Australia, England and India have an obligation to share the wealth. They they get the massive broadcast deals. Now, the West Indies don't have the capacity or facility to have big broadcast deals. They don't, they don't have that facility. And it's eye-wateringly expensive to play cricket in the West Indies because you've so many different islands. And so the big three have a massive obligation to make sure that other test playing nations are right financially. They've got to do that um, because they'll finish up playing just amongst themselves. So yeah. that was a significant win 
for the West Indies. And everybody loves the underdog. Everybody loves a young player coming through and achieving like Shamar Joseph did. And so two test matches. I did a thing before Christmas with with Clive Lloyd, who was one of the greatest cricketers that, that we've seen, particularly captain of the West Indies. And he said to go to Australia to play two test matches, that can't possibly be a series. Yeah. And test cricket has got an obligation because in my opinion, and I'm certain Phil will be exactly the same, when you're growing up as a kid, I want to play test match cricket. Yeah. That's what I want to play. So the authorities have an obligation to ensure that it's in good heart. And of course, you're you're going to be back commentating for this series. Um, how good is it to be getting back behind the microphone again? Well, you know, I'm a pensioner and, and I've been out of work worldwide. Uh, for a, a couple of years so you know I'll be back uh, doing radio which is where I first started I first started on on test match special and working with Peter Baxter who was a producer at that time went into TV and so I've, I've found my way back home I love doing radio and I'll be doing the third test match and I've done it before off tube we, you know it, technically now it, it, it's not that difficult to do it off a tube and not be at the venue. It's always nice to be at the venue, yeah. uh, but thoroughly looking forward to it. And I, I've done. I've had a couple of jousts with uh, Simon Jordan and Jim White. He don't take any prisoners, that Simon Jordan. He, he, I wrote a piece, and, and it were a bit bit too strong. I, I wrote a piece in the paper, and I, I thought well, it's a bit too strong. And saying that when Bashir couldn't get in, I said we should all come home. <laughs> and he ripped me to pieces, Simon Jordan, and I was frightened to death. I thought, hang on, I'm a pensioner here, leave me alone. Uh, Bumble, you've been involved in sort of multiple aspects of the game. What 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 role have you enjoyed the most? Did you sort of player, coach, umpire, of course, for a while, um, and, and commentator. What have you enjoyed the most? Well, there's nothing beats playing and the, you know, those days end. And then you, you get into other things. I loved umpiring. I absolutely love that because you know what they're up to. You know what the players are doing. You, you know exactly what they're up to. <laughs> and you manage that pretty well. But I didn't have DRS. I had none of that. You just give them out or give them not out. It's as simple as that. It's what I see. It's not what you see. Unlucky. Um, commentating, I, I'm, I'm a pretty private bloke, really, but... For commentating, if I give me a microphone and give me a cricket match, and I'm like a little kid, I just flip it and love it. And that comes back to an upbringing where my dad, my dad were, my, my mother were an absolute firecracker. She'd be in jail now. She used to hit me with a frying pan, my mother, <laughs> and she'd be in prison. But my dad was such a quiet bloke, and he just used to say, "Just be yourself. Whatever you're doing, be yourself." And you know, I try to do that. And if you cock up, you cock up. Yeah. You know, that, but he was he was a lay preacher, right? He was, I you're a lay preacher. My, my mother wasn't. My mother, we, we they were Aspins. My mother were from thirteen brothers and sisters, thirteen of them. And I've got my family tree going back to seventeen hundreds. We were terrible. We were, <laughs> we were the Aspins. Uh, crikey, by gum, we we were we were we were. It's, I mean, we were street fighters. So you get stuck into anything, and I I think. You know, I'm I'm pretty private, but I've got I've got my mother's streak. Sometimes, if anybody <laughs> crosses me, they just just look out. But do you get the speaking, yeah. the the oratory from from your dad and his preaching? Um, probably. You know, I, I you, you won't get me doing it anywhere else. I mean, I go in the pub, and I go in the back room, and there'll be six of us or eight of us, tractor drivers, farmers, and we just chew the fat about this, that, and the other. So I'm not. I'm not one of them. So when I work with Beefy and Gower, you know, they're like fine dining. They like going into posh restaurants and so I'd give me a pint and a curry and I'm happy. <laughs> and I, w I would go out with, with Atherton and, and Ian Ward. That uh, he, he gets thirsty, does Ward. He gets very thirsty. Um, and Nasser had got a pop along. I've got, I've got a tattoo. I, I, so I like going in, in pubs, like city centre pubs into Manchester. And I know, I know my way around. And I like going where it's a bit edgy. And I took, I took Nasser into this pub. And, you know, a pint here, have a lager, have a Guinness. What do you want? He said, I'll, I'll have a glass of water, please. <laughs> and, and the last behind the bar said, we don't do cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> Now, 
We have on the podcast, I don't know if you've heard it before, but uh, Phil serves up a few either-ors. Okay, here we go. Right then, Bumble, these are quite straightforward, mate. It's just either-ors, and you've got to have a little think and then see which one you fancy. Here we go. So, Lancashire or Accrington Stanley? Accrington Stanley. Accrington, okay, lovely, lovely. Facing Lily or Thompson? Lily, the other bloke with crackers. The, the, the other fellow, he, he said, I like to see blood on the pitch. I said, well, I, I, I suppose you mean mine <laughs> and not yours. <laughs> right, now, this is a cheeky one, OK? Sorry about this one, but there's got to be a few cheeky ones oh. in there. Alex Stewart or Michael Atherton? Dead end. Uh, absolute dead end. <laughs> They're both, both absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm not going any further than that. They were brilliant. Love them to bits. Move on. <laughs> I'll let you off with that one. And then last one, TMS or Sky? <laughs> oh, Jesus. TMS or Sky? The sky was great. The sky was lovely. But they let me go. TMS. Yeah, get in there. Fair enough. I think a chorus of cheers around the around the <laughs> land on that one. Bumble, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you. We could uh, we could be doing this all day, but uh, it's been a joy. Thank you so much for joining us. Cheers, coach. Anytime. Yeah, look forward to it. See you soon. See you, cat. of course another remarkable test match this weekend uh, hours before England's win the West Indies recorded an eight run win uh, away in Australia their first down there since 1997 and their first ever win in a day night test Mike you were there how was it oh it was great I mean two incredible victories I mean the West Indies I mean Australia don't lose in Brisbane there's only <laughs> India recently but they just don't lose in Brisbane they, they've never lost a pink ball game the West Indies are 60 for 5 on that first afternoon we all were there going, well, they'll get by that for 120. The Aussies will rack up 400. We'll be out of here tomorrow night. Yeah. The way that they fought and played and just kind of, they've got this good. The Shamar Joseph is incredible. Box office, right? He's an incredible athlete. He bowls quick. He bowls sharp. He bowls a little skinny nipper at about 145. And it was remarkable. When you think that the night before he gets hit on the toe, and, and we ruled him out, he's not playing again. He's not playing in the test match. So, the West Indies are a bowler. And then we arrive on the last morning and it was absolutely hosing it down all morning. There was never going to be any play. And about 45 minutes to go before the two o'clock start, the clouds didn't disperse, but it stopped raining. So, well, I'm going to get some play here. And then all of a sudden, Shamar Jones, if he arrives out of the dress, he's going to bowl. They're like, oh, OK, this could be interesting. And then they get a good start. And then he just, he got this one ball to Cameron Green that just bounced off a length. And then he, he just, it was it was remarkable to see a bowler. And, and it's happened a lot of times in the last few years where you get these great bowlers on a, on a run and they look like they're going to get a wicket every ball. And he did. He was just getting yeah. these these deliveries in the right zone, just nipping back, nipping away, getting a bit of bounce. Uh, it, it was special. And to think that, you know, I, I was next to Brian Lara in the commentary box. He was in tears. And down the box in, in another radio uh, station commentary box, Carl Hooper, he was in tears. You know, that's what it meant to the West Indies. It was it was special to be there and to see the celebrations of the young kid Shamar Joseph and all his teammates running around, you know, those kind of famous West Indies celebrations. And that is right up there. I've seen many from the 80s, but that was right up there with with, with real, like, joy. Yeah. And I, again, I said that the Aussies was, were cheering England on. There was quite a lot. I said the majority of the Australians were, del- I wouldn't say delighted, but they were happy to see this young West Indies side get that Test match victory. It was a special afternoon. Well, world, world cricket needs the West Indies, doesn't it? It needs them performing. Yeah. It needs them winning. Yeah, and I'll tell you what it is. It's really good for the Test series in the UK in the summer. Yeah. You know, I know that the grounds will be full because of, of the way that England play, but, you know, I think if they can add Jaden Steele to this attack, they've got some pace. You know, they really have. Got, and, and they're great to watch. They. The likes of Kevin Hodge, who's come here for the first time, he's, he's into, into his second test match. A great character. Kevin Sinclair, Phil, he does a somersault when he gets the wicket. He does a flip. <laughs> he's got to stop doing that, Mike. He's, he's going to end up in tears one day. I tell you. He's got to stop that. 
No, it, it's just the joy that they bring and, and and also the skill levels that they produce to to push this Australian side. They actually pushed them a little bit in Adelaide for a day and a half. But um, this Australian side, uh, uh, they've got to be very careful because I thought that they used this series to just blood a couple more bowlers and maybe a, a new spinner, particularly in Adelaide and played two spinners. They've obviously got Cameron Green at four and Stephen Smith in the second. He's played beautifully uh, opening the batting, but they look to tie a team. And I know they've played a huge amount of cricket. They've won the World Cup and they've come straight back and played a, a five kind of uh, test summer here in Australia, pretty much back to back. Um, they've got to be just careful that they, they don't get to a year and two years in particular for the Ashes. And some of those players are a little bit over the hill or they haven't given any opportunities to other players mm. and then suddenly get two or three injuries. And I think this Australian team could be the, could be there for the taking in a couple of years' time. Yeah, yeah. Well, you talked you talked about the joy. You talked about the celebrations and then that last wicket by Shamar Joseph. Uh, if anybody hasn't seen it, they need to look up the clip. He takes takes a wicket uh, and then goes off on a victory run, and his teammates couldn't catch him till he'd gone beyond the boundary. Oh, he's rapid. You're not <laughs> catching him. <laughs> he, he is. Yeah. <laughs> no. No, oh, he's a wonderful ball. I mean, I've obviously seen him in two test matches. A remarkable story, um, you know, the way where he's Guyana. Uh, to think now that he's getting all these opportunities in T20 leagues around the world. But he said something, you know, in, in the interview after, he will always be there for the West Indies in test match cricket. I thought that was crucial, wasn't it? And you sort of, however much money's thrown at me, I will all be always be available for the test team. Yeah, and I think that's why it's important that the, the West Indies players get get a little bit more in terms of uh, financial uh, contracts because, you know, if, if, if those contracts don't arrive and these leagues keep knocking on the door, he will eventually say yes to them. Yeah. You know, because he's he's got a family, so it's only a short career. And, you know, I just think that's why the, the purse, the, the kind of funding uh, that we see from the powerful three just needs to be spread that little bit more. I'm not saying that the powerful three shouldn't get what they get. They should get a huge amount because of what they bring. But, Certainly, uh, some of the other teams could do with a little bit of a helping hand. And if they don't get that helping hand, and contracts can't be somewhere similar in terms of the basic rate that you get as an international cricketer. Uh, don't don't be surprised if some of these players go and play in, in all these franchise leagues around the world. And we have to try and stop that. We want them all playing test match cricket for as long as possible. Mike, I like the way in the presser, in the presser afterwards as well, he thanked the doctor for his injection in his <laughs> 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 but he was on a hat trick. We, he was on a hat trick, and, and me and Smith, who was in the the commentary, we we could interview him. So we took the fine cow, we interviewed him, and uh, I, I think a question, you know, how are you feeling? He said, "No idea what the doctor gave me, but it's worked." <laughs> 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 but as you rightly said, Ben, it, it was exactly what Test cricket. I, I, I love all cricket. I love T Twenties. I love I love T. I just like watching cricket, but you just don't get that emotion. You don't get that day in a T20 or a 50. You just don't get. And simultaneous test matches, how good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 yeah, they, I mean, both matches on their own stand uh, on their own. But to, to have the two on the same day, I was like, well, what do I watch now? Well, I, exactly. But if, if we could have had another four countries playing, you know, the best cricket is the only product that's being played around that time. I think that's where we, we, we could end up going. In terms yeah. of trying to save test cricket, is that we do have these windows, and all the countries are playing cricket test cricket at the same time. So you could have four or five games simultaneously starting on a Thursday, you know, finishing on the Monday, or, or maybe even dare I say, these four day tests are pretty good as well. If you know you play aggressive cricket on pitches that are quite imbalanced for bat and ball, um, I think, and I hope that's where we'll end up in a few years' time. That uh, test cricket has these little pockets, these windows. Well, that's the only format that, that that's being played at that time. Well, if you've got five tests like that, finishing like that at the same time, I think there'll be a, a few heart attacks around the world. <laughs> <laughs> that's all we've got time for today. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Phil. A massive thanks to Bumble Lloyd for joining us too. Next up for England is a second test in Visakhna Patnam, and we'll be back with you next Wednesday to unpack that one. If you're new to the podcast, it's good to have you with us. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any episodes over the course of the series. And while I have you, a quick recommendation to sign up to the Telegraph Cricket Newsletter. It's free and it keeps you up to date with the latest cricket stories as well as featuring interviews with the biggest players and delivering analysis of the international game. Sign up to receive the newsletter in your inbox every Wednesday at telegraph.co.uk forward slash cricket hyphen nerd. 
That's a bit of a mouthful, so I'll repeat it. Telegraph.co.uk forward slash cricket hyphen nerd. Until next week, goodbye.